Today I'm joined by Breja Larsen. Breja is Olympic champion 2012, representing the USA, USA in swimming in the four times 100 meter relay medley. Welcome, Breja. Thank you so much for having me. I'm very excited to talk today. Really cool. Breja, how did you get into swimming? So my family did a lot of summer, summer recreation swim, um, but I didn't start swimming club, so competitive swimming, until I was about 17 years old. And that's quite interesting, right? Because you won the Olympics at the age of 20, so that's only three years of competitive swimming. Just about, yeah. <laughs> so when did you take up swimming for the first time? Um, I probably learned how to swim when I was about four or five years old. Um, just to make sure that I was safe groundwater. But I didn't start competitively um, at, until the age of 17, mostly because my sister was much better at it and I was very competitive. And so I wanted to do other sports. But I knew when I was a senior in high school that I really wanted to go to college. And so I, in, in my ignorance, I thought if I just worked really hard at one sport my last year of high school, I'd be able to get some kind of money to help pay for college. And the very luckily for me, it did work. Um, I know it's a little peculiar to go about it that way. Yeah, I believe that. I also saw you wanted to become a gymnast earlier. So how, how was that? Gymnast and then swimming? So that was um, mainly just a childhood dream. So I grew up in, a, in an area that was very high poverty and low income. And I just remember wanting to be an Olympic gymnast my entire life. So I would just practice my cartwheels in the front yard and, and make my own dance routines in the living room, just wishing that I could be an Olympic gymnast. And my first day on the pool deck with my coach, um, on my first day of swimming club, he asked me if I had any Olympic dreams. And I told him that it was always my dream to be an Olympic gymnast. And he began to explain that swimming was just like gymnastics that every time you dive into the water, you have to have the perfect angle and finesse and grace, and all of your technique has to be perfect and powerful, and every flip turn has to have the perfect landing. And he just made swimming sound like a beautiful water dance. And that's really when I began to fall in love with the sport and seeing it as so much more unique and entertaining and special than just staring at a black line all day. Cool. In your athletic life, what was your darkest moment? Oh, my darkest moment. There was one morning, um, I call it my oatmeal story. Um, I was very beaten down about the second month of my freshman year in college. I felt like I was going to fail some of my classes. I wasn't, smart enough, I wasn't fast enough to finish the swim sets with the rest of my team. And there was one morning when I sat down and I tried to eat my breakfast and I kept choking on my food. I was too tired to eat. And I felt extremely pathetic. And I tried to go back to my room to take a nap, but my muscles kept twitching so I couldn't fall asleep. And so I was just in this state of not feeling smart enough, not feeling fast enough, not being able to eat my food, not being able to sleep. And it just became very dramatic and it came tumbling down. And I just wanted to know why I was there. Why was I trying so hard? I didn't see the light at the end of the tunnel. I felt very alone. Um, so I sent my mom a message about that just telling her that I, I wanted to quit. I didn't want to do this anymore. I didn't know why I was there. And she sent me back a really simple phrase that just said, Bria, this is what it feels like to be a champion. How hard you're working, how tired you feel, that's what champions do. And that's all she said. And that really hit home to me. And I just began to think, you know, of all the champions all over the world, no matter what they're doing, whether it be you know, the architects or the politicians or the coaches or the parents, all the champions in every job go to bed feeling absolutely exhausted. And I wanted to be a champion, so I had to learn how to desire feeling like that. So now whenever I do go to bed feeling absolutely exhausted, I just smile. I think I got better today. Mm, cool. If we put it into perspective, when was it in which year? Was it before the Olympic success or after? Uh, that was before. Before. Mm -hmm. Okay. And in the qualification for Rio, from my research, what happened? You were Olympic champion 2012, four years later, mm -hmm. in the qualification for the Rio Olympic Games. What happened? Mm -hmm. I think it was a lot of mental work, really, to be very honest. 
um, the pressure of trying to continue to be one of the fastest in the world and all the money that was involved, it, it really got to me. And I began to try too much. And, and I don't know if that makes sense to a lot of different, even athletes out there, but in breaststroke, my particular stroke in swimming, sometimes when you put in too much effort, it slows you down because your muscles tighten up. And before I had this beautiful ignorance to just go out there and have fun. It's just a water dance. You stay loose, you relax and you swim fast. And I wasn't relaxed and I wasn't loose. I was so tense and I wanted it so much that that was kind of my downfall. And then if you combine these two experiences, qualifying for London and qu not qualifying for Rio, what did you take with you for the next preparation towards Tokyo 2021? Oh, so much. <laughs> you know, I think, I think even in the Olympics, if you look at a lot of different sports, sometimes when it's their first Olympic Games, those athletes do incredible. And I think it's because they go in there with no expectations. They just want to go out there and have fun and play and do their thing. And then there are athletes that have been the best for a very long time. But what about the in-between? There's this strange inverted curve that a lot of us will go through. And, and when we hit some sort of peak, we fall into this pit. And it's the true athletes and the, and the true genius behind every sport. If they're able to realize how to get back up to build their confidence, to build their motivation, to understand that there is such, there is such a, a friend in your head that can be your enemy or, or your, you, or your um, cheerleader. If you can learn to be your own best friend and be kind to yourself and be patient with the progress, I think that's where a lot of the success comes from. And so that's what I've been working on the last four years is just dealing with, you know, understanding that the U.S. is very, very fast. And my competition is very steep right now. But, you know, if everyone has an opportunity and it all comes down to the hundredth of a second. And if you have a lane, you have an opportunity. And I want to take that. And I want to make it mine this time. Yeah. That's an interesting one, what you said about having the friend in your head. Um, I think as an athlete, most of you guys are very perfectionist. So you have to be hard on yourself on one side, pushing yourself forward, but you also have to be friend of yourself. How would you see that? Oh, absolutely. I think um, even your best friends should still be hard on you at times. Like you, you can fully understand if you're putting in the right effort. If you can give an honest effort every day and know you couldn't have done more, then you can be happy with that progress. But if I swim an incredible time, but I know I could have gone faster, then I, I'm fully aware and I, I'll admit that. Like there's more room for improvement, but the same goes the other way. If you, if you consistently beat yourself up for a bad performance, it's not going to help your confidence. It's just going to harm you later down the road. And so, you know, I, if I were to picture my best friend, they would be supportive. They would be tough on me and they would be loving and understanding and appreciate the hard work. Really cool. Well, what's your best moment? Oh, honestly, my, One of my favorite moments um, was not only winning the Olympic gold, but seeing the reactions. I think that was very rewarding. Seeing how excited and proud my coach was, was a very special feeling. And even after that, and, and this doesn't really have much to do with swimming, but one of my favorite things to do is to find underprivileged youth groups and show them the Olympic gold and have them hold it in their hands and realize that it's an actual thing. And maybe they don't have to play a sport, but they have their own metaphorical gold medal in their life that they can go after. And that it doesn't have to just be something you see on TV. But if you're brave and you, and you think about the right path, you can get to your gold medal. And, and so I think those moments just kind of, they occur as often as I, as I try to make them happen. Um, but I think the experience as a whole was probably pretty incredible. I believe that. If you could travel back in time, 10 or 15 years, what advice would you give a younger Breya? Oh, start swimming sooner. <laughs> um, I think there, I am in, I have a disadvantage in a way that when you develop the right kind of muscle memory as a younger child, it just, 
creates more opportunity later. And, and I'm not saying you have to start at a super young age, but just having more opportunities um, and being willing to say yes more often to opportunities that come by. But I think, I think overall, and this is very hard for younger children growing up to learn how to be kind to themselves. Mm. I think that that mental health aspect is so important. Yeah, I believe that. That comes back very often in the talks I have. Coming back to the point that you said start swimming sooner, there's actually a note I've taken down here that you started fairly late. Would you think you could have been better if you started earlier? I think so. Yeah. Um, because when I went into college, I only really swam breaststroke. And so once you get to college, they usually specialize you. And in, in high school, they do so much development where you learn how to swim every single race with the right technique. And I didn't have that. I just started my last year of high school. And so I didn't have that proper development um, throughout the you know, first 10 years of my sport. It's, it's funny, I'll, I'll have uh, moments with other professional Olympians And I'll say, you know, I just discovered that if I do this trick, then it does that. And they'll say, well, yeah, I learned that when I was 18. I'm like, okay, how long were you swimming when you were 18? They go, about 10 years. Okay, I've been swimming for 10 years. <laughs> so now I just got it. <laughs> yeah. So I am still a late bloomer in a lot of that. So there's still a lot of scope for development. Yes, much, much. <laughs> in I also read you have a multi-sport background, right? So we talked about gymnastics, but then I also read something about lacrosse or softball. Can't softball, yeah. I played softball for seven years. I played volleyball for three years. I did track and field. I loved playing all the sports. Any sport that the school district offered, I'd want to jump in and play. So that would probably also somewhat have contributed to your swimming success. Oh, I think so, yes. Yeah. yeah. And I, I loved weight training. I've been lifting weights since I was probably about 14 years old. And I, I really enjoy being strong. And so I think that translated very well to swimming. How is that received in the swimming world? Because I hear there's also different discussions, right? How much can strength training help or weight training help with the swimming performance? What's your take on it? I think that when you're looking at younger athletes, um, having good technique and form is very important. Even, even now, um, a lot of the older athletes aren't always paying close attention and they'll want to lift a heavier weight when they don't need to. So when it comes to swimming, you want to find um, weight workouts that complement your swimming and you don't have to overpower certain muscle groups, but they need to learn how to do the right technique with just their body weight before they add any weight to it because it can stunt your growth plates. Um, and so you have to be very, very careful But I think that with the right exercises, it can be very beneficial. You just have to understand and learn how to do those exercises and be smart with it. Cool. What are the habits that make you a successful athlete in person? Oh, being able to wake up early when no one else will. I think people always ask, what's your secret? Like, what is the secret sauce? And I think it's just being willing to do it every day. You know, yeah. and... and When, um, when I go out of town to go to a friend's wedding, I'll still wake up at 5 a.m. and get a swim in before the wedding starts. I'll make sure that I don't drink alcohol because I know I have to wake up to swim again. So it is, a, it is hard to try and balance um, a full life with a swimming career, but if this is what you want, then you're willing to put in the sacrifice to do it. You finished two studies during your career. So what are the habits that allowed you to excel at sports and in studies? I think time management is big. Um, whenever I had 20 minutes, I knew what to do with it. And making that plan beforehand and preparing for it is, is very big. Um, my backpack always weighed like 40 pounds. <laughs> it was so heavy with all of my textbooks. Because if I had 20 minutes before practice, I would study. You know, if I had 10 more minutes before one class, I would take out another book and study that book. But I finished my bachelor's degree in psychology and my master's in sports management. But I think um, education is very important to me. And I'm, I'm glad I was able to get two degrees in. I believe that. We just talked about early mornings. What's your morning routine? Um, well, before COVID, <laughs> I would wake up about an hour and a half before my practice. And I would stretch for about 40 minutes 
Um, my dog would be there with me. So we'd have her a little bonding moment through stretching time. And then I would have a quick breakfast, just a small snack breakfast, and then do a two hour swim. And I would stretch again and then take a big breakfast, go and lift weights, come back, stretch again. And then typically if I had another workout, I'd fit that in. And if I didn't, then I would usually try and fit in a lot of different Zoom calls and meetings. How do you prepare yourself for important moments? For what moment? Important moments. Moments. I think rehearsing in your head is a very big thing. So there's positive visualization where you think of everything going right. And there's negative visualization where you think of everything that could possibly go wrong. And how are you going to maintain your composure if that happens? And so I think a lot of rehearsal and practice before really big moments is important, whether it be a sports performance or a public speaking event and, or even having a conversation with someone that is, is very important. But I think rehearsal and, and knowing how you're going to react to different scenarios can help you keep your confidence moving forward. So for instance, um, with swimming, right, preparing for that, I know that if I am out on the world stage about to race, and I try to fix my goggles and they break and snap off my face, it's okay because I have three extra pairs in my pocket. And same with my cap. If I dive into the water and my goggles fill and they're full and I, I can't see, it's okay because my eyelids don't control the strength of my body and I can swim with my eyes closed. I know how many strokes it takes to get from one point to the other. But if you prepare that enough in your head and it happens in real life, you know you don't have to panic because you know the type of reaction you're going to have. And you just mentioned the negative visualization and positive mm -hmm. visualization. Can you elaborate a little bit on that? Yeah. So positive visualization to me is just thinking everything going perfect. Think of the exact scenario you want to happen. Think of all the senses. What does it look like? What does it smell like? What does it sound like? What are you wearing? How do you feel? Are you excited? Are you nervous? Are you hungry? Are you full? And everything going perfectly. And just going through that again and again. And that's what I used to do before 2012 Olympics is just positive visualization all the time, having a smile on your face, getting ready to go out there. And then what if something bad happens? How are you going to react? It's kind of like a, I call it a fire drill. So when a fire alarm goes off in a room, everybody jumps. They're scared for just a second, but then they don't panic because they know what to do. They leave their things at the table and they walk outside and wait for further instructions. So why don't we do that for other important events? Why don't we think what those alarms are going to be that go off in our head that make us scared and how we're going to remain calm and move forward with the next step? So that would be the negative visualization for me of thinking of everything that could possibly go, go wrong along my performance or, or the important event itself and how I'm going to react and overcome them. Yeah, okay, cool. I read at the London Olympics in 2012, the 100 meter breaststroke final, you fall started, but then what happened? You, uh, the, the information I, did, I, get, I got wasn't very clear. So you fall started, but then you ended up six. Yes, so the buzzer went off. So it did actually go off and I was the only one that jumped in. And so when that happened, they called it a technical malfunction. And so since I reacted to a buzzer, it wasn't a false start. And so they allowed me to swim again. But the, when I got ready to go back into the race, I remember trying to reset my brain, but I was terrified. I was very scared. I was very nervous, but very determined. And when I jumped in the second time, I saw the big underwater camera that started racing with us. And I just remember thinking, The camera follows the fastest swimmer. So if I just try and beat the camera, I'm going to win the race. That way I don't have to look at them. I just have to see the camera that's right under me. And so I chased the camera as fast as I could. And by doing that, I wasn't following my race plan. I had a very particular strategy in my race. And I think because the early buzzer went off and I jumped in all by myself and I had to go through that experience, I wasn't thinking straight. I was just so focused on trying to get the Olympic gold medal that I saw this moving rabbit, right? Just this, this shiny thing that started moving fast and I just chased it. And that was a very rookie move. <laughs> it was a very ignorant move, but I've never been in that situation before. And I think that goes back to the negative visualization. 
What if there's a camera beneath your lane? How are you going to deal with it? What if you jump in early? How will you maintain your composure? How will you make sure that your head stays in a safe space so you can stay focused? Yeah. Okay, that explains because I also saw that the time you swam in the Olympic final was one second slower than qualifying for the Olympics, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. How do you overcome setbacks? I like to learn from them, honestly. So every time I have a race, I go up to my coach and ask the same question. How do I go faster? So if I have a terrible race, it's usually pretty obvious what I need to work on. It's still difficult to go through those emotions, um, you know, of, of being upset or being angry or jealous of other people that do better. That's a big one. I think all athletes have to fight through is jealousy. Um, but I think that when you have these setbacks, it's a chance to restart and go back to the drawing board and find out where the bad habits are. Because if you're constantly winning with bad habits, you don't necessarily look back and try and fix them. So when something, something or some big setback comes along in your sport, it forces you to redirect and look at everything. And I think those can often bring a lot of really big positives so that you can really hone in and fine tune your sport and your technique. Who's your role model and why? Oh, that's a very big question. I feel like I gain inspiration and, and look at as a role model to so many different people. Um, I look up to my boyfriend a lot of the time. He works very, very hard. He actually just got into the London School of Economics. I'm very proud of him. Um, one of my friends, Lindsay Rubachka, she is a fighter. She goes through so many trials and helps so many people, very loving. Um, I think Dana Vollmer, uh, another Olympian, is, is someone to look up to. She's a strong mother of two, and she continued to train and has been to many Olympics. And then there's also, of course, swimmers like Michael Phelps, you know, who have been the best in the world, and to see how they handle it in their daily life. And there's so many. I could go on forever. I, I really admire Serena Williams and all that she stands for and what she's done. Um, Yeah, I have a whole, a whole list of, of people that I look up to and admire. And it's mostly, it's not so much the, their spotlight attributes, but how they handle themselves outside the camera that I truly look at and admire. Because everyone has a different face that they wear in, in public, right? So as soon as someone asks me an Olympic question, I turn on my Olympic Bria face. <laughs> but if you're close enough to see what they look like outside of their public face, that's where you see their true values and their determination. And I think it's a beautiful thing. Yeah. And you mentioned Michael Phelps. I also think it's very brave that he went, came out with all the mental struggles he went through and all that kind of stuff. What mm -hmm. is difficult to imagine for people having so much that success he had, but I, I also think it's very brave what he did. Mm -hmm. What's the best advice you received and who gave it to you? There's been a lot. One of them was from Tyler Clary. Um, he was another swimmer. He won gold in the tuna backstroke in 2012. He told me that swimming is not a career. It is an opportunity to gain more people in your network to find your next career. And I thought that was very important. So typically when you become very focused on your sport, that is your entire identity. You eat, sleep, and play, and that's it. And I learned that you need to be able to diversify your personal worth and value to understand that you are worth so much more than just your sport. And it's important to understand that. So if you, I think of it as a financial portfolio. So if you're investing your money, you find different companies to invest in. So if one company fails, your money's okay because it's in other places. So when you look at your personal value, if you put all of it into your sport and you have a bad year, your head is going to go crazy. You know, you're thinking like, no one will love me. No one will appreciate me. They'll all drop me because I didn't perform well. But if you're able to understand where your value lies outside of your sport, those are kind of strong fast holds that keep you in a safe place. And then trying to find different areas that you can grow in as well. So in 2012, I was a student athlete. In 2016, I was a professional swimmer. And I cared so much about it. And that was my entire identity. 
And that's what led to my downfall as I was so focused on it and there's so much pressure. But now I love mental coaching. I love doing different workshops for different companies to try and teach Olympian mindset, goal setting, and just trying to show how powerful your brain can be outside of sport as well. And I think that my setback in 2016 really pushed me to find this passion. And you mentioned it's important to understand the value that lies outside your sports person. Yes. What is your value outside your sports person? I feel like I have many values. Um, I am a very good big sister. That's one of the reasons why I was a little bit late to this interview. <laughs> um, I, I take care of them. I love them. I try to um, volunteer for the Boys and Girls Clubs in our neighborhoods and in our, our area. Um, I love mental coaching and I love trying to teach as many people as I can the value behind their brain and how they can use it to work with them. And so I like to think of myself as a teacher and a mentor and a role model, even outside of swimming. So much so that when I meet someone new, I don't even tell them I swim. I just skip over it. I'll say, no, you look like you work out. So, oh yeah, I love working out, but this is what I like to do. And I'll just not even tell them about swimming. Cool. And talking about being the oldest sister, you are seven in the family, right? And you are the second oldest one? Second oldest of seven. Oh, you're the second oldest of seven. Okay. Yeah. Big family. How does a typical training day look like? Right now um, is very different. I have about an hour and a half of water time a day instead of um, two to four. So it's, it's very different. Um, I do a lot of rowing and a lot of jump rope and body weights work. All the gyms are closed, so I'm slowly working on trying to build my own home gym so I can have more weights to lift. But um, it's a work in progress, and I think we're all kind of struggling with that right now. Mm, I believe that. You help people through mental coaching, goal setting, and mentoring. What mm -hmm. do people get from your help, and where can you find that? Uh, where can they find it? So typically, if it's in a professional setting, reaching out on LinkedIn is great. Um, all of my social media handles are my first and last name got a pretty strange name so I can put it on everything. <laughs> But um, I, I feel that I'm able to help enlighten them and help them understand and see where they can improve on their goals and in their life in general. I think having a second opinion is very helpful. And I love being able to be vulnerable with people, being able to tell them, you know, what I think they may be struggling with and relate it to experiences I've had. So if I'm able to tell them very personal experiences that helps them trust more. And I think if they're able to trust more and give me more information to help them, it creates a, a very, really incredible um, relationship to kind of help them grow. Do you want to nominate someone to be interviewed? Oh, I would love to. I think that you should look into Brad Tandy. He is a South African Olympian. Um, he finaled in the 2016 50 freestyle. And he is a phenomenal character. What's the name? Brad Tandy. Brad Tandy. Okay, mm -hmm. cool. What's going on in the life of Breya at this moment in time? <laughs> right now, I'm just trying to stay in shape, do as many meetings as I can, and hope that the swim season will pick up. We're not really sure if the swim season will happen this year. So we're just doing our best and trying to stay positive. Really cool. Where can people find you? You can find me on Instagram, Twitter, LinkedIn, and Facebook. Very cool. I will link that up. Breya, thanks a lot for your time. That was awesome. Thank awesome. Thank you so much, Christian.